of the things I want to start with is a little bit more about MDOT and why we are the organization that we are. One of the things that we, oh now see I'm going too far. Mission statement is one of the things that we're very proud of. Maryland Department of Transportation is a customer driven leader that delivers safe, sustainable, intelligent, and exceptional transportation solutions in order to connect our customers to life op life's opportunities. This is something that everybody at MDOT lives by and looks towards solutions for. MDOT is everybody. So one of the things that you will see in a lot of what I talk about is that perspective of everything. We look at not just our highways and our transit, we also have our airport, our port, as well as our motor vehicle administration are all in our one happy family and our one, we are all uh, MDOT and it definitely shapes how we look at things. One of the things that we do in terms of planning and Katie referenced that we've been studying solutions here, we've been studying solutions for all sorts of different issues across the state and we really look at everything in a three prong approach. One is our long range plan, this is our MTP. Uh, we look at pretty much what we want to do and how we want to get there till 2040. Uh, she also mentioned that one of the things we do is we put together the transportation portion of the governor's budget, that's our CTP. Uh, and then we also have what we call our attainment report, which is really our yearly assessment of how well we're doing on all of these things. So it kind of gives you a little perspective on why I'm here and what I can bring to this whole discussion. And certainly one of the big topics that everybody comes up with is would ferries reduce congestion on the Bay Bridge? We have been looking at this for quite a while. There were a lot of different studies, but really six that I'm going to focus on between 2000 and 2007. Um, we really were looking at what kind of major additional ferry service. We have ferries in this state. If you go to Baltimore City, the water taxi is a ferry. It's a passenger ferry. It's a very successful one. But we really took a look at major ferry systems that would move people around. I uh, said these are all a little old and really the economic downturn kind of changed the picture of how people were looking at things for quite a while and we're really now getting into where technology has evolved and where things could move now. So real quick we did look at a study along the Potomac River not really as much relevance but I had a different perspective that I'll talk about a little bit later. We looked at things from Crisfield to Point Lookout. There was a Virginia study on the Mid Bay, so we're now a little bit further south. We looked at really the key study was in 2004 on quite a few different scenarios of where service can be provided. Canton, Baltimore City to Rock Hall, Chesapeake Beach was your northern Calvert County across the Cambridge. Solomon's Island, and I'll explain later why it's Solomon's Island, over to Cambridge and Solomon's Island to Crisfield. So we looked at where we could actually provide ferry service that might be able to be successful and have some ridership. Uh, we also partnered with Virginia after that study to look at that lower area, that mid-bay crossing from Crisfield over to Reedsville, which is on the western shore in Virginia. Uh, the other study that I'm going to talk about is an ad hoc um, committee report which was done uh, by an independent group that was promoting ferries. All right. Let me get into a little bit of the specifics. So I said I'm not going to spend too much time because this was up the Potomac River, but this was a very interesting study that um, Virginia really focused on and they involved us because they were looking at different landings in Maryland, but it was really a, co a commuter focused study looking at how you get up the Potomac River to get out of all that congestion along I-95 because they are certainly in another area outside DC that has a lot of congestion. They looked at only a passenger only ferry service and they looked at what they could do to get from that Woodbridge area which is quite south in Northern Virginia all the way up to the Naval Yard and looked at some different connections in between. They were looking at a private operator, but certainly we're looking for some serious public support on the financial side. And they looked at a lot of different grants. We're not so far successful, but they have not given up. But it kind of gives you a little perspective on how much it would cost 
round trip for that passenger and how long it would take. So 45 minutes is quite a while. You think about being on a ferry, but if you're sitting on I-95 traffic, maybe not as much. Uh, looking at something a little bit more relevant on what we've been talking about was Crisfield to Point Lookout. This was one of the first studies that we looked at in the 2000s and it was sponsored by MDOT and we looked at kind of a, a point in St. Mary's County. We looked at Point Lookout because that is the tip of St. Mary's County over to Crisfield. That's almost a straight shot if you're looking at it. Uh, it was around $20 per passenger and 60 minutes. A lot of that time too is not just going across the bay, but also loading and unloading, which when you're dealing with passengers is usually at least five to 10 minutes um, and vehicles at least that much. All right. As I mentioned, there was also a Virginia study that looked mid-bay, so kind of look further south from Crisfield over from Virginia on the western shore to Virginia on the eastern shore. Um, they did a real high level study um, and they looked at what kind of vehicles and passengers that they could have and really look at that kind of connection between the Virginia Bay Bridge Tunnel and our Bay Bridge. Uh, there was a lot of discussion in the public on this one and really on the eastern shore of Virginia uh, they were uh, really couldn't find a good spot to land because all of these are going to have to have a terminal. You've got to have that ferry land somewhere. It's got to have the depth for the ferry as well as all the infrastructure in terms of parking and docks, etc. So they looked at this, really kind of came back and said there's not much we can do, but they wanted to, and I'll talk about later, come back and look at how they could partner with us and maybe hit something on the Maryland side. Now I'm going to spend a little bit more time going through, did I go too far? I did. Um, a little bit more on that study that we talked about in 2004 where we talked about where you could go. This is Canton. I am going too fast, sorry. I gotta put the uh, pointer down. Uh, so the first spot was that Baltimore City to Rock Hall. We really looked at a high speed and a low speed version. So a low speed, you think about the ferries. If you've ever done like the Cape Mary, the Lewis Ferry, that is your classic low speed. It carries a lot of people. Uh, it takes a while to load and unload and it doesn't go all that fast, but they're very efficient in terms of being able to handle cars and even trucks. High speed is more what you think of in terms of, you know, uh, a lot, a catamaran is what they call it. So a lot smaller of a vehicle can go a lot faster. Um, but all of these are fairly expensive to one, purchase the ferry, two, have that infrastructure on either side of the bay. And when we started looking at ridership, we looked at kind of how much you could remove from the Bay Bridge and we're really talking about numbers when you're looking at that as these aren't people that would necessarily be crossing the bay anyway. Those numbers are extremely small for anything and a lot of it has to do with the amount of time it would take you to get out of the Baltimore Harbor. That is not going to be able to be high speed because you're going to have to stay um, fairly low speed while you're in that wake zone so you can see the time difference isn't that much and it's a fairly expensive endeavor. We looked at something a little bit more straightforward that you're thinking of just crossing the bay. So we went from Chesapeake Beach, which if you're familiar is right there at the top of Calvert County. I think we're quite close to where Anne Arundel and Calvert County come across over to Cambridge. Certainly on the Cambridge side, there is a lot more infrastructure. There is depth. People take their boats in and out of Cambridge all the time. Uh, and there is some infrastructure that we could work with on the Chesapeake Beach side. This had quite a bit of traffic that we could remove from the Bay Bridge. When you look at it, that is around 900 would be your top, which is cars and trucks. That's a day. I'll talk later about how much that actually would make a difference. Round trip fares, again, quite expensive. You're going to have to pay for the capital costs of the actual vessels as well as the terminal. And you can see your difference in time is a bit more reduced because you have 
a bit more of the percentage of your trip is out on the open, open bay. Now you're looking at Solomon's Island to Cambridge. I talked about why we didn't do Point Lookout. There was really no place that you could do a terminal at Point Lookout. So they came around and started looking at Solomon's Island. There is you know, marinas there. There is possibility of getting a terminal there, a lot more likely than at Point Lookout, given the state park and other uh, land use around there. Again, this is Solomon's Island. Now you've got to kind of curve around and go back up to Cambridge from here. So your time is quite a bit more and your costs are quite a bit more just to get your car or truck across. So we looked at how do you get from Solomon's Island more straight across to Crisfield. Again, this really is a fairly straightforward cross the bay, but are you really taking anybody off because now you're addressing people that wouldn't necessarily have taken the Bay Bridge anyway when you're looking at the number of vehicles removed from the Bay Bridge and still relatively expensive. When I talked about Virginia's study a little bit earlier, we talk about how now they wanted to come partner with us and we said, you know, we're willing to look at it. Somerset County came in involved and they looked at that Crisfield, again, an area where there is potential for a terminal and connected over to Reedville as they started to do public outreach. What they discovered was the Reedville people were like, go away, we don't want a terminal in our area. Okay, uh, but we really looked at it too is in terms of that feasibility. Now you've got a lot of movement that might have actually taken the Bay Bridge gone up 95 and back around, but we're still talking about only a few hundred to 625 cars and trucks removed a day. Um, so now I talked a little bit about this ad hoc committee. This was a group of ferry supporters. Uh, this was back in the O'Malley administration and they were really looking at what information they can gather from all of the studies that I have just talked about and kind of where we could go from here. They really were looking at a system. That idea of just going from one spot to another did not seem a lot of feasibility to it. So they really were looking at that Baltimore to Annapolis to Rock Hall and really looking at it as a, pa a passenger-only ferry system. So they really didn't do the technical analysis that we did. They really looked at it kind of a, a big picture point of view as advocates of ferries. Uh, they did look at wanting to do a public-private partnership, our P3, where the, pu the public side would be a lot of the funding and the private side would be able to provide that service. Uh, really the big thing that they came back with was this may be feasible to do, but it really doesn't discount the need for third bay crossing. So they gave their report to then Governor O'Malley and really some of the key things out of that were you could start a ferry service relatively quickly if you have the infrastructure and it's um, a matter of buying the vehicles and tying into existing yeah, marinas or other areas where you have that ability to have people park and have people be able to drive onto a ferry. Uh, the big thing that they did say is that this discussion of the ferry system really needs to be decoupled from the third bay crossing that they did not see how that was going to relieve enough traffic off the bay bridge but they still thought that doing a ferry system and he said they really looked at all the way from Norfolk up to Baltimore might be something that could happen in this area, but it really wasn't going to take that traffic need that wants to go from one side of the bay to the other. Um, certainly one of the other things that they looked at was smart growth considerations. Whenever you have that terminal, you're going to now have people coming into an area on the shore that they wouldn't necessarily have been focused on. Um, certainly economic development, you can have different things develop around those terminals and certainly the environmental considerations of what kind of impact that's going to have on the land, on the water, on uh, you know, the, uh, whatever natural and, and human, that's where I was going, human environmental considerations. 
Certainly anything you do, you need to coordinate with the locals, you need to coordinate with the U.S. Coast Guard because they have jurisdiction over the waters in the bay. Um, and they even talked about Homeland Security, which is something that everybody always talks about when you talk about the D.C. area. Kind of where I'm going is in those past two decades, there really have been a lot of different studies that we've gone on, and there's a lot of things that we've done. Geography is a key element population density because really you're talking about needing an area where you can get people on the ferries, off the ferries, and where they want to go. Um, really one of the keys is that termini, having that route at least on one side have some sort of destination where there are enough people and maybe even get that transit so people don't have to drive. If they're going to take it as a passenger ferry, they don't have to drive there and leave their car and then take the passenger ferry across. Tying it into different transit alternatives, really the Baltimore terminus, that's a good possibility. Annapolis maybe, when you get to Rock Hall, you're kind of on the other side. Certainly one of the big things that we get, and I didn't emphasize a whole lot, but if you start looking at numbers, um, is that we really aren't looking at ferries being able to improve traffic congestion. Are they a bad idea? I'm not gonna say yes or no, but are they a solution to the huge congestion issue we have? I really don't think so. You've gotta think about not just the ferry on the water, you've gotta think about the roadway capacity to get everybody to that ferry area, the terminal, and then back on the other side, east or west, get back to a road network. Um, certainly this is really a lot more like transit and some of the areas where ferry services are used in the country, it's really a, another annex on that ferry. So it is something that is generally publicly supported. You still need to have the operations of that ferry system supported by the taxpayers. Uh, public private, yeah, public private partnerships are likely to be the scenario so that you end up with a private entity providing the service but with a lot of public financial support. Um, so really that's our ferry side. When we talk about solutions everybody goes back to transit as well. And we did do a study, I'll be honest, it was a very high level study, um, but it really kind of looked at what would happen if you start looking at providing some transit service. And they looked at everything from a bus rapid transit, so you're basically talking about nice coach like buses in preferably in a separate lane, though they can travel in the, exa in the same travel lane as everybody else. Heavy rail, you're talking your metro um, in DC kind of thing, and light rail. So we looked at a big picture study that really focused on from Ken Island going over dispersed locations on the western shore and dispersed locations on the western shore coming across and then connecting with a transit system to Ocean City. So this graphic is very hard to read, but it gets you that idea of we looked at everybody on the eastern shore congregating at a spot and taking transit to uh, up into Baltimore, Annapolis, and DC. There is a possibility, you know, that's really going to be focused on your commuter traffic. So if the numbers pan out, we might be able to take 620 trips off the bridge a day. The other perspective that we looked at was diverse locations on the western shore connecting up and taking some sort of transit over to Ocean City. Obviously something that would be more focused on that weekend summer trip and you know the largest number that we have is somewhere in that 1,250 trips taken off the Bay Bridge a day. I'm going to go through this real quick because there's only so much that changes. As I said this was a very high level study but it looked at what you're talking about for bus rapid transit. So when you start looking at the mileage and the capital cost, those are the things that are going to change. Perspective, right now, last summer, or I guess we had 2017 was our last traffic data that we had complete. We're talking about in a day, 
118,000 trips across the Bay Bridge on that summer weekend. Generally, the, the 68, when I say off-peak, that means not summer, regular year, not necessarily not on the same, uh, yeah, not during rush hour. So your regular trips, 68,000. So when you look at how far you would have to go to get a bus rapid transit system from your population centers of Baltimore, Annapolis, or DC, you're talking about a lot of money to get that bus rapid transit system in place. And you're really talking about either it sits in the same traffic you are, or we have to take a lane away on the Bay Bridge. You can just figure on how much you would take off that Bay Bridge and how much traffic is in one of those lanes over a day. Again, we did look at that same BRT all the way to Ocean City. Now your costs skyrocket and these are all assuming that you are either running it in the same lane of traffic as everybody else or off on taking one of those lanes away and doing it a reversible. When you get to light rail, you're talking about the same places that we're going to, but now you're talking about costs that are more expensive and you would need to still build another Bay Bridge to put the light rail on and that cost isn't even factored in those numbers. Again, we took it over to Ocean City, all that does is raise the cost a whole lot because you really are talking about a great distance for a light rail system, not something we would probably look at and heavy rail just gets even crazier. Obviously, there's no way the Bay Bridge could handle the weight of a heavy rail system. That would have to be a brand new bridge, and those costs aren't even in there. Not something that anybody would imagine would be feasible. Ocean City is just even further along. Kind of get at where we are with the uh, Bay Transit alternatives. You really need the densities to get transit. When you're talking about a fixed rail or a fixed service, you really need a lot more density than we have. Yeah, we could take some traffic off the Bay Bridge and put it onto a transit system, but those numbers are nowhere near enough to make a big difference and at a very high cost. Um, so really what the study showed, as I said, it was a very high level study, but that there is some demand for transit. People might take something, but these fixed rail or BRT systems are really not what you would want to look at in terms of a transit system. <coughs> Costs are way too high and ridership is way too low. I want to kind of move on and recap a little bit about what I talked about. Again, this chart, there's a lot of information on here um, and we can make this available um, on um, the Eastern Shoreland Conservancy's website. But really you're looking at travel times that are at least in 55 minutes to an hour to get across. Costs for you to get your car across are quite expensive. If you're talking about ferries and you still really don't have a lot of feasible solutions for locations that have enough infrastructure already, so there will have to be costs associated with that. And then you're really talking when you get to the bottom and the transit um, solutions that are just not um, going to be worth putting a lot of energy into when you talk about a fixed rail system and having to build a whole nother bridge and have the impacts of that on the communities on either side. One of the things that people have talked about is, hey, there's new technology. There are battery operated ferries now. You've got your electric cars, you have electric ferries as well. And it's actually a technology that is um, really starting to gain a lot of traction in Europe. Um, so we looked at what, it would, what kind of differences it would be if we started looking at what they're doing in Europe um, and even in Washington state. So we looked at that technology. They are much cleaner. When you start talking about environmental impacts, having a diesel engine versus having an electric engine, huge difference in terms of emissions. Um, you're now much happier. I was reading a story as I was prepping for this about somebody on the ferries in Washington State going, I'm always early on the ferry so I can be in the front, not in the back with the diesel engines. I won't have to worry about that but they are expensive. It's still fairly early um, 
with that technology. Um, but there are ways that you can do electric ferry and make it on the ferry side a lot more environmentally, uh, I said less impactive, we'll say. But we're still talking about when you look at travel times, these distances, really the, the Washington um, State Ferries are cut in that corner. This is about the miles. If you don't know already, the Bay Bridge is a little over four miles. So you're talking about something relatively similar or some of the further ones in Washington State. So you're talking about needing $20 round trip to pay for this, and it's gonna take you at least a half hour to an hour, depending on whether we're going that short distance or some of these ferry studies that I talked about were a lot further along. So I wanna wrap up with two other points. We are doing a current Bay Bridge crossing study. It is not my office, it is the authority. You guys all know that. Um, our purpose and need has been out for a while. We've been doing a lot of corridor analysis and we are looking to have some public open houses this spring. Those dates aren't finalized yet, but stay tuned. Um, but this is also not a process, and Katie mentioned 10 years. This is not something that we're ready to go forward with right now. This is a tier one, so it's really a corridor look at uh, a crossing. Tier two would have to be done, which is your full NEPA document. The other thing, and she talked about uh, travel demand management, and you're gonna hear a lot more later um, from some of the other areas, but I wanted everybody to be aware that we have Commuter Choice Maryland, which is our transportation demand management program that is out of my office um, at MDOT, where we're really looking to try to promote everything. So it is looking at ride sharing and van pooling, more walking and biking, teleworking, flexible work hours, and also trying to con um, encourage people to take more transit. One of the things that I have, if everybody is interested, is something called Guaranteed Ride Home, which helps you if you take your commuter bus from here to the Western Shore. It helps you with um, that emergency. A lot of people don't take transit because they need to get back home um, and they want to have that flexibility to leave when they want to. So we look at having that ability to, when something comes up, be able to get a ride home on those couple days a month where that happens. But really our program is focused on two sides. One is the employers, really encouraging the employers to know what is out there, what's available, and encourage their employees. Certainly the millennials, if you have some employed like I do, they're always looking for a different angle and a different way of doing things, working from home, working different hours. Um, it really gives uh, a lot of incentive to employers. And you also have some tax credits on providing, especially in the more urban areas, providing that transit. But we also look at the commuter side and providing, there's a lot of online and printed resources that we have. I talked about the Guaranteed Ride Home program. And there's always that look at conduct, uh, conducting more outreach to have people understand that maybe flexible work hours, that teleworking one day a week. I have a huge number in my office that telework and they love it. And I'm convinced from an employer's side that I get more out of my employees when they don't have that hour commute each way that one day a week really gives them a lot of freedom. And some of them I have that telework really have commutes that are more like a half an hour and they still swear by it. Um, but so I said, this is out of my office, this Commuter Choice Maryland. There is a website, there's some cool videos that we've uploaded on there to kind of show you what is available. And I'm always available for questions as well. All right. <laughs>